Hello my dear friends, how is it going? I'm Ari Therger and today I'm going to talk about the Icelandic magic staves. <laughs> Hello my dear friends, how is it going? I'm Ari Therger and today I'm going to talk about the Icelandic magic stave, a Gavra Stafur, known as Aigis Jalmur. Probably one of the most tattooed symbols these days, uh, especially among, let's say, new age pagans who have a predisposition to follow some aspects of Nordic paganism, and so they choose this symbol for a tattoo for reasons I really don't understand, aside from the fact that the symbol in question is often thought to be a Viking symbol or a Viking Age symbol. So I really want to make this video to settle this once and for all. So after you watch this video, you can send it to all the people who still think the Aegis Jalmur is a Viking symbol, so they can finally be aware of its actual historical context. By the way, uh, I take the opportunity to tell you that if you haven't watched the previous video I have done concerning uh, Icelandic magic staves, Galdra Stafir, I suggest uh, you watch it. Uh, you can check it here on your right upper corner in this information icon and uh, that video will guide you through the historical background of Galdra Stafir, especially the Agi Sjalmur type of symbols. In that video I have forgotten to leave you a bibliography, I'm sorry. However, I have included the bibliography by the end of the video concerning the similarities between Galdra Stafir and Umband symbols. So you can check uh, that one and uh, those sources by yourself. And also the sources present in today's video, of course, at the very end. Uh, the video on the common misconceptions concerning Galdra Stafir will help you as um, a walk through in today's video because I want to avoid <laughs> repeating myself for your own sake. But certainly a few points will have to be remembered. Um, so let's get straight to it, shall we, my dear friends? Please. All right, starting with a brief summary. The Aegis Jalmur has often thought to be a Viking Age symbol, but it isn't at all, and it has nothing to do with a Scandinavian pre-Christian pagan past, nor is it Scandinavian at, at all, but rather a symbol of the history of modern occultism of Iceland. The Aegis Jalmur belongs to the symbols called Gadra Stafir, literally symbols of magic or magical staves, which are symbols of a heterogeneous nature that appear in Icelandic grimoires, uh, black books, magic books, spell books, if you will, since the 1500s. So we are talking about a symbol whose iconography begins to develop in the 16th century of the Common Era, half a millennium after the end of the Scandinavian Iron Age, commonly known as the Viking Era or the Viking Age. The so-called Viking Age is relatively short, just slightly under 300 years, which follows the end of the Germanic Iron Age and uh, in many ways represents the culmination of the Iron Age in Scandinavia, uh, coinciding with the spread of Christianity in the north already by the 9th and 10th centuries, only the period in between prior to the onset of the medieval period in the north. Again, I repeat, an iconographic representation of what would become the Aegis Jalmur does not appear until the 16th century in Iceland, half a millennium after the end of the Viking Age. This should be enough to eliminate the notion that such symbols have anything to do with the Vikings. It is not even a symbol of the history of Scandinavia, but of Iceland, which is a Nordic country, of course, obviously, but not a Scandinavian one. As we shall see further ahead, and as I have presented in more depth on the video I have mentioned previously, although this is a magical symbol of the history of modern Icelandic occultism, its cultural basis is Jewish, which influenced Eastern European occultism, more specifically within the Byzantine Empire, which progressively marked its presence in the history of modern occultism throughout Europe. As I said, uh, there is a, a symbol that will take some steps in its evolution to reach the form we know as the Aegis Jalmur, which is found in the oldest small manuscript known as Lightning Gagver, Book of Doctors. It's from the early 
1500s, 16th century, right? And here we find many remedies from plants, cures for many illnesses, and also spells, as this was still at, at a time when magic and medicine were practically the same thing, in the sense that usually the administration of a remedy was also accompanied by uh, prayer, invocations, uh, and, and symbols to increase the effectiveness of the remedy for healing purposes. Then we have this symbol <laughs> that I'm going to show you on the screen somewhere in here um, as an iconographic evolution and as a symbol to discover the identity of a thief. Accompanying this symbol, we can see the phrase in nomine domini, amen. In the name of the Lord, amen. We are before a symbol whose cultural basis is Christian belief. This symbol and the text that illustrates it implies the existence of good and evil as concrete but subtle entities and the possibility for the individual to act to change the course of events, for better or worse, invoking the power of God or the devil. This dualistic view is typically Christian. We must remember that some of these symbols indeed invoke pagan deities like Odin and Thor, usually also summoning demons from the Hebrew and the Judeo-Christian culture at the same time. Sometimes the presence of pagan deities in these symbols is misleading, quite misleading, creating the belief that Norse paganism was still strong and had survived even in the modern era. But this is not the case at all. The church did not normally deny the existence of the deities of the religions to which it imposed itself, but limited itself to, to attributing to old pagan deities a demonic character. The range of demons summoned in prayers and incantations followed by these symbols therefore also included ancient pagan deities, but no longer understood as gods, but as demons. Therefore, this does not imply that pagan beliefs have survived into the modern period within an occultic subculture. Rather, it is the evidence to the real degradation of the pagan gods who have become demons and fallen angels of the Christian culture. We are not in the presence of pagan symbols. We are in the presence of Judeo-Christian symbols and religious beliefs. The symbol that I present here now is to scare enemies when you meet them. In this sense, it is finally the most similar one to what we call the Aegis Yalmur, uh, not only in um, iconographic terms, but also in its purpose, to scare enemies away. We know that the Aegis Yalmur is commonly known as the Helm of Terror, uh, precisely to frighten enemies when they see uh, this symbol. <laughs> uh, well then. The designation of a Helm of Terror appears in the Poetic Edda, a collection of poems that have come down to us in a manuscript from the 1200s of the Common Era, 13th century. And this Helm of Terror is told to be a concrete object. In fact, we are in the presence of a mistranslation, quite possibly, and assumptions based on nothing but a personal belief that Galdrastafir are uh, of ancient origin or, or are ancient pagan symbols, and so the sources have been manipulated. There's an Aegis Yalmur mentioned in an earlier source, to be more precise, in Fofnismal. In this source, which I shall develop further ahead, we are not presented with any symbology, no graphic representation whatsoever, but only a term, a designation of the existence of an object that is the Helm of Terror. In the, in the sense of being the Aegis Yalmur, which it seems clear that there was a failure in translation, and in fact, it doesn't mean Helm of Terror. But anyway, an Aegis Yalmur is mentioned, but no particular symbol associated to it. I will talk further ahead about the designation Yalmur, uh, Helmet, and the possible wrong translation into Helm of Terror. Returning to the previous source, the text in Lightning Gakver uh, says, If you want your enemy to be afraid of you, carry this symbol in your left hand. 
As you have certainly noticed, this symbol may be similar, but it isn't the symbol that is being tattooed nowadays. But its purpose is similar and its appearance as well. A helm of terror is spoken of in earlier sources, as I've said, 13th century, 300 years before the appearance of a symbol that was also used to scare off enemies. This leads to another common misconception that the symbol comes from an earlier period because of the same designation and intention. But that's not the case. It's quite clear these symbols appear in the 16th century. And just because they have been designed and given names that remote to earlier written descriptions doesn't mean that the symbols are from the period of those written descriptions. What happened here is that the 16th and 17th centuries, authors of these grimoires consulted similar sources, but through a process of creativity and according to the occultic symbolisms of the modern period, have recycled those materials and produced different results. In other words, the 13th century Helm of Terror, or better still, Aegis Jarmur, that is spoken of as an object to scare off enemies, did not have any iconographic representation. But 16th and 17th centuries, Icelandic occultists created a symbol derived from Jewish religious symbols, giving it the purpose of scaring off enemies and named them, or named it, the symbol, later on, Aegis Jalmur, as an allusion to the Helm of Terror mentioned in earlier sources. Basically giving an old name, Aegis Jalmur, and designation of that object to a new symbol whose intention is the, the same as the intention of the old, the old name for an unknown object. The present form of Aegis Jalmur appears later in the 17th century paper manuscript known as Gadrakfer, Book of Magic. So we have a whole evolutionary process of symbols that appear in the 1500s until finally in the 17th century, the symbol we know as Aegis Jalmur appears. In modern Iceland, or, or um, let's say, in, in Icelandic, we can see the, the designation for this symbol, which uh, in the best possible way translates as, and I quote, Aegis Helmet, it will be made of lead and printed on the forehead when one expects his enemies to find him. And so he will prevail uh, against the enemy. It is as follows below. And then this symbol. So here we have a more recent iconographic repre representation for the, the same purpose as the previous symbol we have seen. Instead of the usual translation of Helm of Terror, we actually have a possible meaning, uh, which is um, High Hears Helmet. Hjalmur uh, may be an a helmet, which would explain why a symbol would be placed on the forehead, um, remembering the, um, the 13th century object placed on the head, uh, which, we shall see, as we shall see further ahead, uh, may be actually a type of jewel or stone that would be inserted on an helmet and in this way a person would use an actual helmet with the stone and thus it would scare off uh, his enemies. However, we may be in the presence of a play of words in here or a, or a failing translation from medieval western Old Norse into modern Icelandic. And it may not be the helmet of High Hir, but instead the helm of High Hir. The will for steering a ship or boat belonging to the old Norse god of the seas, Hair. Or maybe not, not that, not at all, and something else entirely unexpected. But we shall explore this further ahead, don't worry. But before we move on, I should like to add that a type of Aegis Jalmur, uh, one that I would call a pro proto Aegis Jalmur, uh, the one that appears in the Lightning Akfer uh, of the 16th century, previously seen here accompanied by the phrase. In nomine domini, amen, also appears in the manuscript Codex Regis of the Prose Edda, 14th century. And in the Prose Edda tra uh, transcription, uh, manuscript of the 15th century. This has led a few scholars to believe that this symbol is from an earlier period. But that's not the case. The symbol in question only appears in the 16th century. 
but its appearance on manuscripts one and uh, two centuries prior to its creation is because this is a later addition to the manuscripts, evidenced by the difference in color and texture. An addition made in the 16th, 16th century, precisely. The drawing was done next to Snorri's text. It is important to mention this because modern period Icelandic authors consulted earlier documentation and material and made notes on earlier documents. We shall see this further ahead, precisely in the creation of the symbol Aegis Jalmur, whose name was given to the symbol because 17th century Icelandic authors consulted earlier sources where the term Algis Jalmur appears in relation to something else entirely. It must be taken into account that there are no traces, no evidences whatsoever of these symbols in archaeological findings. Not just in Iceland, but throughout Scandinavia. If it were a Viking symbol, we would expect to find it engraved somewhere in Scandinavia but it has never been found. Icelandic medieval manuscripts also make no reference to ancient symbols. As said before, these symbols start to appear and develop in Iceland in the 16th century, and the Aegis Jalmur, as we know it, is developed in the 17th century. And from that moment onwards, its morphology will serve to create other symbols that present the same iconographic similarities, such is the case of the Vegvisir, which I will not talk about today, but it's important to remember that from the moment the Aegis Jalmur is created, 17th century, there are a series of similar symbols that start to be developed until at least the 19th century. These are all modern symbols, neither ancient symbols nor pagan symbols. The emergence of the Aegis Jalmur and such other similar symbols in Iceland is an influence from outside Iceland, with its origins in, in, in the development of the field of occult sciences in other countries. In the Renaissance, a new type of esotericism spread across Europe, based largely on a tradition of Jewish origins, based on the evocation of demons, with the purpose of controlling them for different purposes. The demonic evocation, or the, or the evocations, are accomplished through the use of specific seals or sigils, gathered in large numbers in one of the most widespread texts of European esotericism, King Solomon's Clavicle, or, or the Key of Solomon, Clavicula Solomanis. So we are talking about um, historical testimony of European magic, a source with Jewish roots that influenced continental European esotericism, and not a source of pagan tradition for which there are, there are absolutely no evidences whatsoever. Now, in the 1400s Common Era, in Greece, we have the manuscript known as Harley 5596, which contains one of the oldest surviving witnesses of King Solomon's clavicle. I'm sure that you can see the similarities with the symbols that would later on reach Iceland during modern times and give rise to many Galdrastafir, especially the Aegis Jalmur. You can certainly see the similarities with the Aegis Jalmur in here. This is not an expression of the pagan world. Perhaps this becomes clearer if we take into account that in the 15th century, the Byzantine Empire collapsed with the Turkish advance. Greek scholars have taken refuge in Europe and brought with them a considerable amount of classical knowledge that will help spark the Renaissance. These scholars have brought with them new expressions of occultism, which have inspired others to develop new forms of occultism and symbology. People who may have had directly and indirectly uh, contact with these people, learned these occult practices and symbols by the contact with several European countries that were receiving these influences from Greek refugees, as I've explained on the video I've done about the Balkan religious symbols. So, this includes Icelanders studying abroad, traveling, working, trading, people were on the move, especially during the Middle Ages and modern period, 
and always ex exchanging knowledge and new forms of magic, occult sciences, and medicine. Eventually, Icelanders brought these symbols with them, and finally, there's a great development from this cultural background in the 6th, 16th century in Iceland. The aesthetic elements of Solomonic-inspired demonic seals would suffer some artistic changes in Iceland, bringing to life new magic symbols within Icelandic tradition. In the early modern era, Icelanders were able to develop iconographic elements inherited from European occult culture, which by itself inherited it from Jewish occult sciences. In fact, reading Icelandic grimoires from the early Renaissance and other grimoires that would follow, we notice that they are not very different from the continental European grimoires. For instance, uh, the, the belief in the existence and the evocation of the Christian god and the devil is very well documented in Icelandic grimoires, as well as the presence of invocations of, of or to pagan deities of the Germanic pantheon. But quite explicit that these invocations of, of pagan gods are in the sense or or are, are in the same way that, that other demons in the Abrahamic tradition are invoked, inserting some elements of pagan mythology stripped of their original meanings, but now inserted and reshaped into this new occultic tradition of the modern era. As we have seen earlier, the Renaissance popularized the use of symbols with a Judeo-Christian cultural base in magical books from the history of European occultism. Books called grimoires, which mixed and consolidated knowledge from astrology, the Kabbalah, alchemy, uh, the ritual, and rituals, several rituals of Eastern and Western magical arts, eventually arriving in Iceland in the 16th century. The most famous Nordic grimoire is the Galdrabok, dating from the 17th century, which contains 47 magical incantations, which present precisely the continental European magical tradition that solidified after the 15th century. Now, in relation to the Aegisjalmur, it was cited in two sources of literature. The first one in Fofnismal, stanzas 16 and 17 uh, of Codex Regius of the Poetic Edda, then in the source Volsunga Saga. Aegisjalmur has come to be translated as Helm of O, or Helm of Terror, or even fear helm. There may actually be some translation errors here due to the enigmatic character of this term, which can be a kinning or even an expression that has nothing to do with a helmet, but a word whose meaning was only understood by those who had a deep mythological knowledge of the epoch, and therefore, when literally translated, it loses its original meaning. Let's start first with the source Fofnismal. In Fofnismal, stanzas 16 uh, and 17, uh, and also the 19th, um, the, the helm is also mentioned, but unlike the two previous stanzas, it is specifically a helm and no longer what the dragon Fafnir referred to at first. In this Attic poem, it does not speak of any symbol, but it seems to be something concrete that would bring victory to its owner, according to the dragon Fafnir. And in the same poem, it is alluded to belong to the treasure of Sigurd, the hero, from which it is deduced that it would be engraved on a helmet, but it is only a deduction, as it could very well be a magical object that Sigurd could use as a jewel on a piece of, of armor, such as a, an helmet. Aegisjalmur doesn't really seem to be a helmet, and since this is a 13th century source, a period when many myths were compiled and also heavily influenced by classical mythology through the clergy, perhaps Aegisjalmur is a stone if we remember that this description of a magical object in Fafnir's head is related to a European tradition that goes back to the Greeks and which survived until the end of the Middle Ages. Clearly, the poem refers to the Aegisjalmur as something that the dragon Fafnir wears on his head that helps him to guard the treasure because it causes fear in those who contemplate the object that Fafnir uses. 
in the European tradition that dates back to the Greek antiquity, there's a stone that dragons had on their heads. Snake stone or draconite, uh, draconite or uh, better known as draconite, used for healing purposes. And also in relation to the deadly look that this kind of mythological monster would have. And pay close attention to this part, because this object, draconite, is often referred to, to, to the very countenance of the dragon that brings fear upon those who behold it in relation to its expression, aspect, the very look of it. We are precisely talking about a, a, a mythical gemstone taken from the head of a live dragon and believed to have magical properties. So it seems that this object called Aegis Yarmur goes back to this earlier European myth and is actually not a helmet but a stone on the dragon's head. And perhaps in an earlier myth, the hero, by killing the dragon, would have this stone removed off the mythological animal's own head and using it for magical purposes. This is the earliest Nordic source mentioning this type of object, which later on in some Icelandic sagas, such as Sveri's saga, the object is also cited as giving protection in battles, being a saga that draws elements from earlier materials. But again, this protection in battle as a magical property of the object itself. So, if we, we, if we are looking at a gemstone taken from a, a dragon's head, maybe we can understand why it's called Aegis Yarmur. The terror and fear that the Aegis Yarmur represents may actually have its origins in classicism, derived from the Greek Aegis, such as the shield of Zeus and the cape of Pallas Athena. The Greek word Aegis may have become the helm of terror in folk etymology as a result of phonetic or and written similarities to Old Norse Högre, terrible and Höja, to scare or to frighten. And despite the etymological derivation, Aegis Yalmer originally does not really seem to have any relation to the giant Hair. Some have translated Aegis Yalmer as the ruder of dread or the ruder of Hair due to its shape in the grimoires which is a circle formed by eight arms in trident shape, resembling the ruder wheel of ships. The problem is that this type of nautical instrument, of course, was only known in Scandinavia from the 13th century onwards. Before this period, the Nordic peoples used a transverse oar as a ruder. Right? So the designation of the Aegis Yalmur in medieval sources has nothing to do with the god of the sea, or a helm in the sense of being a ruder or a wheel for steering a ship or, or a boat. <laughs> However, we must not forget that the symbol that came to be called Aegis Yalmur appears only in the 17th century and in this period very likely lost its original meaning from Old Norse and Icelandic sources. And therefore, the Aegir, as, as Aegir was a deity related to the sea, and remembering that the Icelandic magic staves evoked pagan deities as being demons to be invoked alongside other demons and fallen angels of the Judeo-Christian tradition, perhaps the Icelandic scholars of modern times have fused to this myth the trident of Neptune, explaining its morphology, or even the trident of the devil used in the Christian imagination, and uh, invoked in some Icelandic magic staves. So, in the 17th century, when a symbol derived from European occultism was created and called Aegis Yalmur, most likely the meaning was actually meant to either be a ruder or a set of devil's tridents, or fusing the trident of both Neptune and the devil with the terrible demon of the seas, Haier, evoking its terrible power and hence... The, uh, the, the, the idea of causing fear to the enemies of those who use this symbol. But the original meaning of Aegis Yarmur in poetic sources such as Fofnismo seems to derive both from the myth of the gemstone of the, uh, in the head of a dragon and from the Greek term Aegis, the shield of Zeus and the cloak of Pallas Athena. And hence, perhaps, a mistranslation, assuming it came from Old Norse Högre, and terrible, and Höja, to scare or to frighten. When, in fact, the meaning actually comes from the Greek word and the gemstone draconite. To reinforce this idea, 
I.G. Salmur also appears in a late 13th century legendary, legendary saga, the Volsunga saga. Remember what I have said previously, the myth of the Dragonstone Draconite is also in reference to the gaze, expression, appearance and aspect of the dragon, an expression that causes fear. The very stone in a dragon's head has that power. In Volsunga Saga, the dragon asks Sigurd if the hero has never heard about the fact that people were afraid of his Aegi Sjalmur. Here, it has often been translated to be a helmet, but we must read it according to the context, and the dragon is not referring to a helmet. He is referring to Aegi Sjalmur, his Aegi Sjalmur, in the sense of the fear people have of his appearance. And then the dragon speaks of Aegi Sjalmur again, which gives us an understanding that people continue to fear the dragon upon looking at him. And even though he does not feel stronger or more terrible, people's fear of him was enough to keep them away from the treasure, and this sort of reputation made him not fear any weapon, simply because no one dared to come near him because of his terrible appearance. He's Aegi Sjalmur. So this reinforces the idea of the dragon stone draconite in relation to the, the terrible appearance of, of a dragon that causes fear to those who beheld it. So, in conclusion, <laughs> we have two types of Aegi Sjalmur. The one that is mentioned in earlier written sources, 13th century, which isn't a symbol and it has no iconographic representation, but seems to be a reference to the classical myth of the gemstone draconite with its magical attributes, a stone in the dragon's head, which in Nordic medieval literature or literary sources is part of a treasure the dragon, Fafnir, has inherited and now protects, which reminds us of the Harkon stone the dragon smog in Tolkien's The Hobbit is guarding, which demonstrates that Tolkien was a genius <laughs> and understood the original meaning of the Aegi Sjalmur in Fafnismal and Völsunga saga. This classical myth became quite popular throughout Europe until the late Middle Ages, and it makes an appearance in these Nordic sources. Both this gemstone and the relation with the terrible appearance of the dragon was called Aegis Sjalmur, from the Greek Aegis, Alpha Is, in the, in the sense of a protective shield or magical gemstone, and the implicit idea that was in the dragon's head and could be placed on a helmet or the hero of the hero that, that slew the dragon to have the same effect on the hero's enemies to drive them off, to cause fear, probably an allusion to false reputation. People feared the dragon's Aegis Sjalmur in the sense of fearing his terrible aspect, his countenance, and that reputation kept them away. Just the same way the hero would cause fear to his enemies by having the gemstone Aegis Sjalmur as a false reputation because he clearly must be terrible and quite strong for having defeated a dragon. So imagine what he could do to mere mortals. The dragon in Volsunga Saga is quite clear when he says that he, he doesn't feel any stronger or more terrible, but the terrible reputation alone was enough for him to not fear any weapon because people simply would not come any closer due to fear, right? And then, finally, we have the other Aiki Sjalmur, which is the one that appears in the 17th century. A symbol derived from the occultic European tradition with its cultural basis in Judeo-Christian magical traditions. Finally, a symbol appears, and its name, Aegis Sjalmur, is added to this symbol, not because it has anything to do with the original gemstone, but modern Icelandic altars were taking inspiration in earlier sources, not for the creation of the symbol, but to give it a name. Since the symbol in question had the purpose to cause fear, because it seems to be a representation of the devil's tridents or of the trident of Neptune fused with both the mythological conceptions of the old Norse god of the sea, Air, and with the devil evoking their terrible powers into a symbol to cause fear, and so they named it Aegis Sjalmur, drawing inspiration from earlier sources of an object, not a symbol, but an object, that had the same 
purpose and was called Aegisyanur, a gemstone in relation to a dragon, and the symbology of the dragon with Christianity became an aspect of the devil. So the symbol Aegisyanur is only an earlier name that was given to illustrate a new symbol created in the 17th century to express its purpose. While the original Aegisyanur is etymologically related to the Greek Aegis and uh, to the Draconite gemstone, um, the modern Aegisyanur may be a mistranslation but also a clever play of words, connecting it with the sea god Ai here, now deprived of its original pagan conceptions and now understood as yet another demon to be evoked by the symbol itself. So there seems to have been a transition here from a concrete object, but also the very aspect of a dragon, to a symbol that inspires fear in one's enemies. A fusion of an earlier concept present in a term with a, with a, a, a modern symbology from post-Renaissance occultic European traditions. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed today's video. I hope it was useful. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, a for you. Thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. Farewell. Now it's Gigi time. No, 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 no. You are fit. You are fit. You are fit.